Снова. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Andrei Shevchenko. On behalf of the Ukraine Media Center team, I welcome all the reporters who are telling the world about our fight for freedom. Today we have a special event. We have the honor to welcome the representatives of five organizations from the United Nations system who are now supporting Ukraine in the situation it faces now. And the first person I would welcome to this floor is Saviano Abreu, who represents the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. The colleagues that are following us. We are reaching now almost three months of war, um, a war that caused death, immense human suffering, and a massive destruction of civil infrastructure. In the last, just in the last few days, we have again seen houses, schools, health centers destroyed in Karkivska, Luhansk, Donetsk, and now in the Sot and Odessa blast. The humanitarian crisis here in Ukraine is getting worse by the days. We all know, and that's why I mentioned the destruction of civil infrastructure, but I want to repeat, the path to the conflict have an obligation under international humanitarian law to protect civilians and civil infrastructure. This also includes ensuring that civilians can safely leave war-affected areas in the direction they want. Yet, we all know, and I repeat, people here in Ukraine, they are trapped in areas that they cannot leave because of the fighting or because the roads are contaminated by mines or other explosives. Many lack access to essential water, food, electricity, education, health service. We have reports that people trying to leave her son and the blast for days without succeeding. I saw myself queues of cars of people trying to leave Mariupol and Zaporizhko blast. They didn't succeed either. The United Nations and our humanitarian parties here we have been working day and night to support these people. We have reached more than 6.4 million people since 24th of February, and we know that we have to do more. My colleagues are going to explain a bit on the details of this work. We, we need to do more, but also we need to have an understanding and agreement with all paths to the conflict. They must uphold their obligations under international humanitarian law and guarantee the safety, protect, safety and protection of civilians everywhere in Ukraine and safe passage for humanitarians to reach people that need our support. We stand ready to do our part the most to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Victoria Andrievska, United Nations Refugee Agency. Or we'll switch to Margaret Harris, World Health, Health Organization. Good morning. WHO has said it every day and will continue to say it every day. The attacks on health must stop. We have verified 226 cases. That's unprecedented. And we know there, will be, there are more. We are looking at more. 79 pe 75 people have lost their lives and 59 people have been injured. The war has having a devastating impact on health, not simply through the rubble and the damage to hospitals, but the effects of people being moved around and the effects of the destruction of infrastructure such as water, the mixing of water and sewerage in places where the damage to the water system has been drastic means there's a big rise, a big risk of rise of infectious diseases caused by water, including cholera, and we are pre-positioning supplies and vaccination for that. But all infectious diseases, diphtheria and measles for children, COVID-19 has not disappeared. It did not disappear because the war began. It is still present and it is a very big risk for people who are living in crowded conditions, difficult conditions, unable to take the measures that will prevent COVID. We are scaling up vaccination, particularly COVID vaccination, but vaccination of children for the routine disease, the routine vaccination to prevent measles. We're also seeing, even amid the rubble, even amid the destruction, that Ukrainians are continuing to repair, restore, and continue to operate a viable and fantastic health system that was so 
had, had gone through great reforms before the war. It's like you're driving a car that was pretty good, it gets banged up, but you keep fixing it. We are providing ventilators that can, be, can work without electricity, work off batteries and turbines so they can continue even if the electricity goes, and we're providing oxygen plants that provide a hospital with autonomous oxygen. So again, if you can't get supplies, you can still continue to save lives. But as I said, the only remedy, and our World Health Organization, our World Health Assembly starts this weekend, and the theme is peace for health, health for peace. And the only remedy for health in Ukraine right now is peace. So peace to you all. Thank you. And now Victoria Andreevska, United Nations Refugee Agency. Victoria. Welcome, dear reporters. Welcome from Ushgorod. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Good. So, after the war started, UNHCR scaled up its operation as part of the interagency effort, working closely with uh, the government and the local communities uh, to provide support to people who are displaced or affected by the war in Ukraine. Uh, now there are eight field offices of uh, UNHCR uh, operating across the country. The humanitarian situation in Ukraine is uh, devastating. One third of Ukrainians have been forced uh, to from their homes. And this is the largest human displacement crisis in the world today. Some 8 million people are now displaced internally within Ukraine. Um, UNHCR's response grew more than three times. With our local NGO partners, uh, we have reached more than 120,000 people so far with uh, protection services, assistance through cash or essential household household items such as blankets, kitchen sets and mattresses and um, shelter support. We have delivered aid convoys to a number of hard-to-reach areas such as Sumy, Kharkiv and Severodonetsk and supported those people who evacuated from Mariupol last week. Despite our collective efforts, the needs in Ukraine are huge and growing. The longer the war continues, the more needs will grow and will require sustained support from the humanitarian and broader international community. I thank you all for your attention and I pass the floor back to my colleagues. Now, Victoria Michalchuk, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. Thank you, Andrei. Good afternoon. Dear audience, since February the 24th, FAO has scaled up its activities in Ukraine and is closely working with the Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food to support agricultural production, improve food availability and access to food. According to the FAO, at least 20% of crops may not be harvested or may not be grown, which will further reduce supplies and will have serious consequences for Europe Central Asia and other countries that depend on food supplies from Ukraine. FAO has developed a rapid response plan, which requires 115 million US dollars to support about 1 million people uh, until the end of 2022. To date, FAO has supported around 33,000 families, which is over 85,000 people in the east, south, center, and west of the country. 18,000 of these families receive potato seeds, another 15,000 are receiving vegetable seeds, and another 4,000 families are receiving cash assistance. With more resources, FAO will be able to help more producers, small and medium-sized uh, medium agricultural products, by providing grants to support the development of agri-food value chains and to the rural households growing food for their own consumption. Thank you for your attention. World Food Program. Paul. Good morning, Ukraine. Conflict and insecurity are the main drivers of hunger. In Ukraine, there's a line to the fastest growing humanitarian emergency in the world. 23 households in Ukraine are food insecure. 
majority being internally displayed burdens. That an increase in scope and a lack of food or money includes people having smaller meals. Of adults eating less so their children have enough. The World Food Programme will stay in Ukraine for as long as our support is needed and is wanted, working as part of an alliance of humanitarian groups and other partners. To date, we have reached 3.83 million people with food and cash assistance. This month alone, we have here providing food assistance to 2 million people inside Ukraine through cash or a one-off or a one-month food ration. World Food Programme has signed an agreement with the Ministry of Social Policy to scale up transfers for half a million people across Ukraine. Cash transfers allow people to buy the items and services they consider most important. Every dollar spent by a family in Ukraine is directly injected into the local economy. Our cash transfers complement Ukraine's social protection systems. Also complementing these systems are direct food distributions that provide wheat flour for bakeries in hard-to-reach areas. This ensures that business continues and supports volunteers, city councils and national humanitarian partners. Thank you. I would now invite our guests to join me uh, at, at the podium to make the best use out of the time we have for questions. And uh, if we do have questions on the floor, I'll be happy to take them. And I'll, I'll, I'll maybe start myself with, the, with a very general question. I would like you to compare the situation you see in Ukraine to the situations that uh, the United Nations have dealt with in other parts of the world in the recent uh, uh, years or in the last uh, decades. We hear a lot from the foreign journalists that, that come to this media center about the complexity of the situation. We are talking about the scale of the conflict. We are talking about the geography. How do you see this? So much of my work has been on um, disasters and emergencies in countries in parts of Africa. I was recently in Afghanistan. The difference here is there is a functioning government and society that is being attacked. But it's a functioning government that is running its country, knows what it's doing. So we here, as, as certainly as WHO, but I'm sure our other partner agencies, uh, here to support and do what we can and to fill in the gaps and needs. But I think, as I said before, I'm seeing that Ukrainians are really ingenious and really, really good at supporting each other and finding solutions very, very quickly. I mentioned a ventilator. It's actually a Ukrainian developed vent ventilator. That's an extraordinary bit of work. Now, our job was to pre-qualify it and ensure that it works and it's safe and it's great. But this was a Ukrainian developed invention that has enabled people to continue providing health care under the worst circumstances. But what we're seeing is, for, for what I'm seeing here is a country that was going in leaps and bounds on improving health and providing good health to the people and having that pushed back, destroyed by attacks. And that's why we say the only solution is peace. I, I want to compliment very quickly on, on the complexity here. I think one of the things that we should mention is how fast the crisis uh, went in just a couple of months. We're talking about 25% of the population that had to flee, had to leave their houses. And inside of the country have near, nearly 16 million people that now need humanitarian assistance. We didn't have this reality here before. Before the 24th of February, the United Nations and our partners were operating only what we'd called back then the contact line in these areas, in the two oblasts in the eastern of the country. In two months, we had to scale up and operate in the 24 oblasts in Ukraine. So this is complex, and we're doing so, but we're doing so in an area uh, impacted by war. So it has the challenges of a war, the, the conflict, the insecurity, and also the access challenge that we have in many parts of the country. We all know that her son, for example, could not reach because he didn't have agreement to, to enter the area and provide assistance in, in, in a place that we know that people desperately need our support. Well, I'll also ask Victoria Andreevska and Paul Anthem uh, to join us if they have something to add. Uh, Victoria? How would you compare this crisis uh, I think the colleagues have responded uh, have responded to this question. Indeed, it is a very complex situation. We do see that there's need uh, 
to both people who were forced to um, flee to save their lives and there are also people who stay in hard to reach areas hard to reach for humanitarian assistance indeed it's a very very complex situation Paul? yes I, I think also what we need to consider is that the uh, the impact on global hunger and how we're here at we're a, a center point basically in terms of exports to countries that are reliant on the grain and the huge amount of grain that come out of Ukraine. Thousands of tons of grain sits in silos in Ukraine and the absence of that on the world markets is worsening what's already a catastrophic hunger crisis. So what we need to see is the reopening of the ports but to protect Ukrainian agricultural production, but also the food exports that are critical to global food security. And that's why this crisis has such magnitude because of its impact on countries already vulnerable and suffering extreme degrees of food insecurity around the world. Next question from the floor. Uh, Hello, I am Maxim Solonevsky uh, from Ukraine Media Center. My question is, there are a lot of Ukrainians who are now outside of Ukraine. And they essentially do not have uh, lots of access to information. Very often they are lost. They don't know what to do, who to go, who to contact, how to set up their life uh, as refugees. Each of them is trying to find their own way to cope, uh, trying to find their own uh, way to sort accommodation work and so on. Um, is there any UN program or agency which deals with uh, informing uh, those Ukrainians who have fleed Ukraine, uh, who are refugees, so that they would understand what to do in this situation? Thank you. I would uh, give the floor to Viktor Andreevsky now. Thank you so much for this question. Indeed. Uh, UNHCR works uh, a lot with those Ukrainians who are now um, in Europe. I'm talking about the figures. Starting February 24th, over 6 million, 124 um, refugees have found shelter in Europe. Uh, UNHCR uh, has a special page. Uh, on the web and you can find the contacts of uh, our offices there in different countries and you can contact uh, uh, UNHCR office and get information there. So my advice uh, to people who are at the moment coming uh, <coughs> from Ukraine to different countries to use this opportunity and to contact um, UNHCR's offices in European countries. Hi, um, the New York Times. Um, I have two questions related to food and hunger, one maybe for the FAO and the other for the WFP. My first is, um, what, is uh, what plans are underway now in terms of helping Ukrainians to get grain out of the country? What, are, what do you see as the realistic options? And my second question, which is about the impact on global hunger, um, what are the areas that you're most concerned about being um, indirectly basically affected by the war in Ukraine. So I think the first question should go to FAO. Thank you so much for this question. Indeed, there's uh, a big problem with uh, exporting food from Ukraine. We know that now the scope of the export has reduced greatly. So FAO now is working close with the Ministry of Agricultural Policies and um, is now calling uh, for uh, the reopening of the ports, uh, for the deblocate and reopening the, the ports uh, in Odessa. And also we are helping find alternative routes of export and we are developing alternative strategies so that uh, produce from Ukraine will be supplied in other countries. Because indeed there are many countries, especially in Africa, who are very dependent on uh, supplies from uh, Ukraine. <coughs> and for them. Yeah, we, Western, we know that Western European countries are working um, 
and we're looking to get the ports reopened. And this is really the only option to get the proper capacity that we need for exports. But we're also looking at safer ports, overland exports as well. The capacity is limited, but there is potential to increase that. Um, according to our calculations, there's a potential for about 15 to 20 percent of what was feasible through the ports. However, the prominence of the Black Sea ports means that alternative export routes have insufficient infrastructure to be viable, sustainable alternatives to the required scale, and that's why it's so important we get the ports reopened. But um, obviously, we're not the politicians, and that's not our role, but we are monitoring that closely and hope to get, as soon as ports are reopened, that we can be in exporting again. We heard that uh, up to 20% of the world population might feel the impact of the war when it comes to food because of the uh, because of grains and uh, uh, and because of other things involved. Could you specify what areas we should watch and what areas globally are your biggest concern? This will be to Paul. I think the question was about some um, specific geography that we should we should focus on. Yes, yeah, specifically, specifically, we're um, we're talking about countries which are in a, a deep degrees of hunger. So we're talking about Syria, we're talking about uh, Afghanistan, we're talking about Yemen. These are the type of emergencies where we're looking at people already on the brink and facing starvation. And they were already facing a perfect storm due to COVID, due to rising food prices, due to insecurities, due to conflict chiefly. And all that this conflict has done in Ukraine is to compound those difficulties. And those countries could at least rely on the food that we were able to transport to them through the port and out of Ukraine. So once that is stymied, once we're not able to do that, this is really threatening to topple several countries over the edge. And it is my understanding that it's also because of some destructions in the fertilizers market, uh, which might be felt uh, around the world. Now, I would like to ask a different uh, question. Talk about the evacuation and Ukrainian refugees. Throughout these weeks and months of the aggression, we've been hearing that uh, it's been extremely difficult to organize humanitarian corridors to um, uh, let uh, civilian population flee um, the affected areas. And there's been some criticism on the um, ineffectiveness of the international system, which is there to find solutions. And we understand that also a lot of uh, problems are caused uh, by the lack of willingness from the other side uh, to organize these humanitarian corridors. So my question is to Saviano. Uh, how do you deal with these challenges? Well, I think you, you explain well. We have not reached the agreements that we need with both parties to make this work. Um, I think we also in the last weeks, we did manage and we saw that it's possible. We did the evacuations together with our colleagues from the, the National Committee of the Red Cross of people from Maripol and Azovstal. We had three rounds of evacuations. We managed to get to safety in Zaporizhia uh, more than 600 people. And this was possible because we had an agreement with both the Ukrainian government and the Russian Federation. These operations they have to be agreed by both parts of the conflict. There is no way we can do a safe evacuation. The safe passage is with agreement to both parties. If one of the parts don't agree, we cannot do the, the, the work. We, we, we saw, we all seen here that there are initiatives from one of the parties of volunteers doing whatever they can to support people, try to flee, flee this area, but this is not safe because we're talking about the, I mentioned before, is a, is a, is a conflict area, it's a war zone. So if people live in areas without agreement of a safe passage, there are risks, and we saw in many occasions, passes that have been hit and by hostilities in this, in this uh, environment. So we keep our engagements, we are talking the most high levels with both parties to make sure that we can operate more safe passages so people that are stranded, trapped in areas experiencing tense hostilities, they, if they want to leave, they could do so and do it safely. 
Could you give us any details on the negotiations uh, about Mariupol and about uh, our fighters uh, on the Azovstal factory? On, on the fighters, I cannot enter into these details. It's not uh, the UN mandate. We're not, we're not uh, operationally uh, involved on the evacuation of the fighters. Uh, this as, is an agreement between the two countries. Um, on the other evacuation of civilians, um, I can talk what, about what passed, what we did before. We normally don't uh, say in advance what's going to happen because it could jeopardize our operations. So we are in negotiations, of course. We are uh, talk with, with the countries and we will keep talking and uh, pressuring them and calling on them to agree on the safe passages. And this is our mandate, it's our work and we're going to be uh, doing whatever it, it, it takes to, to make sure that we can uh, rescue people that want to leave these areas. Next question from the floor. Hi. I am Lesia Solovchuk. It's the Page Media. My question is on the refugees. Now, quite a lot of people are returning back to Ukraine. Do you know how many of them are returning back? Do you have any figures? Also, I'm interested in cash assistance from the UN. How many people have gone the cash assistance? We know that it's popular and there are sometimes long queues to get this cash assistance, so that is my question. And the third question is also on the figure. What do you think should be the general um, fund to support Ukraine? What should be the uh, general sum? We start with Viktor Andreevsk. Thank you so much for this question. Let me start with uh, the return of Ukrainian refugees into Ukraine. Indeed, lately UNHCR has uh, seen uh, quite a few people moving back, but it's still too early to say it is um, a stable trend because the situation is still volatile. So it's difficult to say whether all the people are coming back to stay permanently in the country or they are just coming back temporarily and then you will back, and they will return back to the countries where they took shelter. In terms of the figures, you can find the figures on the website of the State Bodyguard Service of Ukraine. I think recently they have mentioned that uh, about 1,600,000, if I'm not mistaken, have returned into Ukraine. But it's very, very difficult to um, tell it um, completely and to say that it is a stable trend. In terms of the second question, indeed, a cash assistance is very, very important because we understand that people who have left their homes quite often, um, well, they couldn't take all the essentials they need. Uh, they could just grab a bag with whatever they had. And now, um, the IDPs have lots of needs. Uh, that's why we have this program of paying cash assistance so that people would buy the essentials, medicines, maybe uh, some clothes and food and also probably pay for renting their accommodation. So this program exists and it's quite active. At the moment we have over 300,000 people who registered for this cash assistance. And you probably know that uh, within three months there will be payments. It's a small support, a small payment, but still it's very important for uh, every uh, IDP. Victoria, there's also a question about the general figure. Do you know the general figure of support? <coughs> okay, Seriano. On the general figures, just to... to... Um, uh, add to what my colleague Vittoria said, uh, in total, our organizations, UN and partners providing cash assistance here in Ukraine, we are reaching now almost 700,000 people. Um, and we are scaling up at, uh, very fast now. It was challenging at the beginning of, with the registration process. So we had some delays, as we might, you all might know. But now we, have, we are reaching uh, almost 700,000 people now, and we are increasing by 100,000 uh, each week. 
So you, you, you are at scale now and reaching people with this cash assistance, as my colleague Victoria said, is one of the most dignifying ways that we can support people. They can make their own choices on what they need to do for, for them. On the funding that you asked as well, um, the United Nations and humanitarian partners here launched an appeal uh, six days after the, the war started and we revised it recently. Now we have a, a request for international community uh, to support us with 2.25 billion um, in, in, in funding for the humanitarian response here. Um, we have to say that the support is remarkable. We received so far 1.3 billion, um, almost 6% of the total that we requested. It, it is enabling the, the humanitarian response to take place, but of course it's still not uh, the total that we need and we're going to keep uh, revising these figures as the war is not even close to end and humanitarian needs are still growing. So we probably going to revise these figures soon and we're going to have new, a new request, but so far we have 60% of what we requested funded. I would like to switch to healthcare uh, and uh, my question will be to Margaret Harris. Um, we understand that there are several factors which make the situation with healthcare in Ukraine right now um, very difficult. Uh, first, it includes uh, the damages to the physical, medical, or healthcare infrastructure. Uh, we know that uh, uh, many hospitals were damaged or destroyed. Some of them were specifically targets of the Russian attacks, including airstrikes. Secondly, obviously, there is a huge effect of the, uh, of the very dramatic and drastic uh, fighting. And third is the COVID and the, con the consequences uh, of that. What's your suggestions? How uh, all these uh, losses uh, can be substituted, or what can be done about that, and how how the uh, how the international community can help Ukraine with that? Thank you. That's a really good question. Uh, what existed before, as I mentioned, was a, a, a health system that had really been strengthened by reform, and one of the things that was really critical was the ability to provide primary care close to where people were through mobile teams and now that sort of work we've seen this particularly with mental health um, psychological services providing mobile teams that go reach people and ensure that the people with most severely psychiatric illness could actually be reached that can be applied to other types of health care so we as the international community are working very hard with the ministry of health um, uh, we as WHO, I should say, uh, to ensure that uh, we support uh, mobile teams that can reach the needs where they're needed, but also support people within the hospitals where they are with the kind of supplies that weren't needed before, things like um, uh, trauma care, uh, the increased amounts of intravenous fluids, blood fridges, um, even things like special orthopedic materials, there's something called external fixateurs that you put on broken limbs to hold the bones together so that you can avoid amputation. And we've been really increasing the amount of training we do with um, uh, all, the, all the surgeons who you've got fantastic surgeons here, but they weren't expecting to do war surgery. So they've had to then train to find ways to deal with people who have been either wounded in, in fighting, but also due to explosions and destruction uh, when, when missile attacks have occurred. We've also been looking at preparations for, for management um, or, or for management of, say, chemical attacks or uh, other um, disruptions. So there's a great deal we can do. But as I said before, the most important thing we can all do is bring about peace. One last question before we do the wrap-up. Microphone, uh, Yes, I would like to ask Ms. Harris on what are your recommendations in case there's a, a chemical attack? And one more quick question, if I may. You've said uh, that, uh, for example, uh, that a coping strategy uh, in case of lack of food might be the adults having uh, less food and giving more to children. So what are other coping strategies or recommendations?
mentioned, actually the biggest risk is there is there's a you know an advanced industrial. Um, uh, this is a, it got an industrial economy, and you have many pr plants and so on where, when there is bombing, uh, chemicals can be released. So that's what I was referring to. But indeed, we are working with the authorities to ensure, and and with the health system to ensure that if that should occur, if there is danger of chemical spillage, that the preparations are in place to protect people, and that the doctors and nurses and the the paramedics, the ambulance services, know exactly what to do. So that's really really important. On people, exactly, you're absolutely right to mention when people are hungry, when they're displaced, when they're cold, their immune systems are weakened and there is a much increased risk of um, infectious diseases particularly because that's what your immune system fights. So that's why we really are saying we must scale up immunization because being vaccinated gives you that power to fight an infection even when your immune system is in a, in, in a weaker state. So it's absolutely critical that if offered vaccination or if, if your children are offered vaccination, make sure you get it done. Uh. I'll take that this question has, has been answered. And my last question to all of you will be this. What are the lessons learned from this war and from this crisis? I think you hear it from the Ukrainian people that there is a huge demand for the United Nations system to improve, to adjust, and uh, to provide better support and better help to nations like ours that happen to be in the armed conflicts and in, in the wars. So I'll, I'll invite uh, those of you who are ready to speak on the lessons learned, learn what the United Nations system and what the international system should learn from this war. What I have to say is that too many lives here have been turned apart because of this war. And we are doing what we can to support them. It's not easy to operate on a war zone. It's not, uh, we don't do at the pace that maybe we wanted when it started, but still, it was one of the most ferocious uh, conflicts that we saw uh, in the last uh, period, in the, in the recent story. Uh, we have, as I said before, 25% uh, to, to of people of, of Ukraine had to leave their the, the houses. And it's not that simple to make sure that we reach them at uh, the, the, the speed that they want. We had to establish here in Ukraine a whole entire humanitarian system to support these people. And I do think that we did at the fastest way that we could with the resource that we had at this moment. We're going to keep making uh, it work. We're going to keep working to make sure that we can reach more and more people each day. But we have to have in two considerations that some of the challenges that we have here are, go beyond of our capacity and has to be solved and agreed by the Ukrainian government and the Russian Federation so we can support people, whoever they are, wherever they are. Victoria Andrievska. I think, well, in terms of lessons learned, or these important ideas which would help us respond. We are collecting these ideas from all over the world because UNHCR is operating uh, all over the world in uh, the most complicated situations. And what's really important for us is to deploy our operations as fast as possible. This is the priority because uh, in the very first months, um, I mean, these first months really matter for the humanitarian assistance. That's why for us it was um, a lot of effort to deploy our operations, all the logistics centers, to be able uh, to uh, send aid to different corners of the, uh, of the country. And this was the most important. And now we already have a network of uh, local partners, uh, staffers, local communities and will continue these efforts. Margaret Harris. Yes. yes, and I think I the first thing is clearly the worst disease we know is war because it inflicts damage on all aspects of health, all levels of health. But the second uh, lesson is when you're in a country like this that was already in re health reform, already building up the health, as the damage occurs, 
you keep building. You don't wait for the end. You keep building now. We keep working with the Ministry of Health and building now so that what is there at the end is even better. Well, Anthem, World Food Programme. I think this conflict underlines the catastrophic impact of conflict on hunger, the number one driver of hunger globally. And that has been underlined by this, by this war and by its impact within Ukraine and, and throughout the world. I think we've seen the importance of working to support the government, to complement the systems already in place, social protection systems, for example, through the cash transfers that we provide, and supporting the local government that way, ensuring that local economy, jobs, livelihoods are sustained within the country and being there as a support for that. Also, we've underlined the importance of working in partnership, working in an alliance with humanitarian agencies, with NGOs on the ground and with other partners, complementing each other's skills, making sure we don't duplicate. These are all key pointers that we, that we take from this emergency. Victoria Mikhachuk. I will briefly add to what Paul said. Indeed, this war is reaching far beyond Ukraine. When we talk about Ukraine, locally we have very good relationship, partnership relationship with um, many organizations, and this helps us reach more people with aid. And indeed, these uh, small organizations so locally, um, they were able to respond faster. That's why we are working through these local partners to be able to provide aid to people in need as fast as possible. Thank you so much, Sena Breu, United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Drievska, United Nations Refugee Agency, Margaret Harris, World Health Organization, Paul Anthem, World Food Program, Victoria Mikhachuk, Food and Agriculture Organization. I would like to thank you, your teams, your agencies for supporting Ukraine, for helping us to get through this war and this crisis and uh, stand with Ukraine.